Roughing It by Mark Twain, Chapter 42 What to do next? It was a momentous question. I had gone out into the world to shift for myself at the age of thirteen, for my father had endorsed for friends, and although he left us a sumptuous legacy of pride in his fine Virginian stock and its national distinction, I presently found that I could not live on that alone without occasional bread to wash it down with. I had gained a livelihood in various vocations, but had not dazzled anybody with my successes. Still the list was before me and the amplest liberty in the matter of choosing, provided I wanted to work, which I did not, after being so wealthy. I had once been a grocery clerk, for one day, but had consumed so much sugar in that time that I was relieved from further duty by the proprietor, said he wanted me outside, so that he could have my custom. I had studied law an entire week, and then given it up, because it was so prosy and tiresome. I had engaged briefly in the study of blacksmithing, but wasted so much time trying to fix the bellows so that it would blow itself that the master turned me adrift in disgrace, and told me I would come to no good. I had been a bookseller's clerk for a while, but the customers bothered me so much I could not read with any comfort, and so the proprietor gave me a furlough and forgot to put a limit to it. I had clerked in a drug store part of a summer, but my prescriptions were unlucky, and we appeared to sell more stomach pumps than soda water so I had to go. I had made of myself a tolerable printer, under the impression that I would be another Franklin some day, but somehow had missed the connection thus far. There was no berth open in the Esmeralda Union, and, besides, I had always been such a slow compositor that I looked with envy upon the achievements of apprentices of two years' standing, and when I took a take, foremen were in the habit of suggesting that it would be wanted some time during the year. I was a good average St. Louis and New Orleans pilot, and by no means ashamed of my abilities in that line. Wages were two hundred and fifty dollars a month, and no board to pay, and I did long to stand behind a wheel again and never roam any more. But I had been making such an ass of myself lately in grandiloquent letters home about my blind lead and my European excursion that I did what many and many a poor disappointed miner had done before, said, It is all over with me now, and I will never go back home to be pitied and snubbed. I had been a private secretary, a silver miner, and a silver mill operative, and amounted to less than nothing in each. And now, what to do next? I yielded to Higby's appeals and consented to try the mining once more. We climbed far up on the mountainside and went to work on a little rubbishy claim of ours that had a shaft on it eight feet deep. Higby descended into it and worked bravely with his pick until he had loosened up a deal of rock and dirt, and then I went down with a long-handled shovel, the most awkward invention yet contrived by man, to throw it out. You must brace the shovel forward with the side of your knee till it is full, and then, with a skillful toss, throw it backward over your left shoulder. I made the toss and landed the mess just on the edge of the shaft, and it all came back on my head and down the back of my neck. I never said a word, but climbed out and walked home. I inwardly resolved that I would starve before I would make a target of myself and shoot rubbish at it with a long-handled shovel. I sat down in the cabin and gave myself up to solid misery, so to speak. Now, in pleasanter days, I had amused myself with writing letters to the chief paper of the territory, the Virginia Daily Territorial Enterprise, and had always been surprised when they appeared in print. My good opinion of the editors had steadily declined, for it seemed to me that they might have found something better to fill up with than my literature. I had found a letter in the post office as I came home from the hillside, and finally I opened it. Eureka! Never did know what Eureka meant but it seems to be as proper a word to heave in as any when no other that sounds pretty offers. It was a deliberate offer to me of twenty-five dollars a week to come up to Virginia and be city editor of the Enterprise. I would have challenged the publisher in the blind lead days. I wanted to fall down and worship him now. Twenty-five dollars a week. It looked like bloated luxury, a fortune, a sinful and lavish waste of money but my transports cooled when I thought of my inexperience and consequent unfitness for the position. 
and straightway on top of this my long array of failures rose up before me. Yet, if I refused this place, I must presently become dependent upon somebody for my bread, a thing necessarily distasteful to a man who had never experienced such a humiliation since he was thirteen years old. Not much to be proud of, since it is so common, but then it was all I had to be proud of. So I was scared into being a city editor. I would have declined otherwise. Necessity is the mother of taking chances. I do not doubt that if, at that time, I had been offered a salary to translate the Talmud from the original Hebrew, I would have accepted, albeit with diffidence and some misgivings, and thrown as much variety into it as I could for the money. I went up to Virginia, and entered upon my new vocation. I was a rusty-looking city editor, I am free to confess, coatless, slouch-hat, blue woolen shirt, pantaloons stuffed into boot-tops, whiskered half down to the waist, and the universal navy revolver slung to my belt. But I secured a more Christian costume, and discarded the revolver. I had never had occasion to kill anybody, nor ever felt a desire to do so, but had worn the thing in deference to popular sentiment, and in order that I might not, by its absence, be offensively conspicuous and a subject of remark. But the other editors and all the printers carried revolvers. I asked the chief editor and proprietor, Mr. Goodman, I will call him, since it describes him as well as any name could do, for some instructions with regard to my duties, and he told me to go all over town and ask all sorts of people all sorts of questions, and make notes of the information gained, and write them out for publication. And he added, Never say, We learn so-and-so, or It is reported, or It is rumored, or We understand so-and-so, but go to the headquarters and get the absolute facts, and then speak out and say, It is so-and-so. Otherwise people will not put confidence in your news. Unassailable certainty is the thing that gives a newspaper the firmest and most valuable reputation. It was the whole thing in a nutshell, and to this day when I find a reporter commencing his article with, We understand, I gather a suspicion that he has not taken as much pains to inform himself as he ought to have done. I moralize well, but I did not always practice well, when I was a city editor. I let fancy get the upper hand of fact too often, when there was a dearth of news. I can never forget my first day's experience as a reporter. I wandered about town questioning everybody, boring everybody, and finding out that nobody knew anything. At the end of five hours my notebook was still barren. I spoke to Mr. Goodman. He said, Dan used to make a good thing out of the hay wagons in a dry time when there were no fires or inquests. Are there no hay wagons in front of the truckee? If there are, you might speak of the renewed activity and all that sort of thing. In the hay business, you know. It isn't sensational or exciting, but it fills up and looks businesslike. I canvassed the city again and found one wretched old hay truck dragging in from the country, but I made affluent use of it. I multiplied it by sixteen, brought it into town from sixteen different directions, made sixteen separate items out of it, and got up such another sweat about hay as Virginia City had never seen in the world before. This was encouraging. Two non-parel columns had to be filled, and I was getting along. Presently, when things began to look dismal again, a desperado killed a man in a saloon, and joy returned once more. I never was so glad over any mere trifle before in my life. I said to the murderer, Sir, you are a stranger to me, but you have done me a kindness this day which I can never forget. If whole years of gratitude can be to you any slight compensation, they shall be yours. I was in trouble, and you have relieved me nobly, and at a time when all seemed dark and drear. Count me your friend from this time forth, for I am not a man to forget a favor. If I did not really say that to him, I at least felt a sort of itching desire to do it. I wrote up the murder with a hungry attention to details, and when it was finished experienced but one regret, namely that they had not hanged my benefactor on the spot, so that I could work him up too. Next I discovered some emigrant wagons going into camp on the plaza, and found that they had lately come through the hostile Indian country, and had fared rather roughly. I made the best of the item that the circumstances permitted, and felt that if I were not confined within rigid limits by the presence of the reporters of the other papers, I could add particulars that would make the article much more interesting. However, I found one wagon that was going on to California, and made some judicious inquiries of the proprietor. 
when I learned, through his short and surly answers to my cross-questioning, that he was certainly going on and would not be in the city next day to make trouble, I got ahead of the other papers, for I took down his list of names and added his party to the killed and wounded. Having more scope here, I put this wagon through an Indian fight that to this day has no parallel in history. My two columns were filled. When I read them over in the morning I felt that I had found my legitimate occupation at last. I reasoned within myself that news, and stirring news, too, was what a paper needed, and I felt that I was particularly endowed with the ability to furnish it. Mr. Goodman said that I was as good a reporter as Dan. I desired no higher commendation. With encouragement like that, I felt that I could take my pen and murder all the immigrants on the plains, if need be, and the interests of the paper demanded it. End of chapter 42